Hello and good morning and welcome to our Bible class for September 12th, 2021. And uh, this is the beginning of our fall Bible study. Uh, I'm sort of titling it Hope for the Future. Uh, we're looking at the Messianic prophecies in Isaiah. And at the moment, I'm. Uh, this is of course the pre-recorded one. Uh, I th may try and get do a live stream one of what we do Sunday morning in the sanctuary as well uh, and see how that works and see how that goes. Um, so just kind of heads up for that, uh, for those of you who are paying attention to that kind of thing. All right, so as we're getting into Isaiah, uh, we're going to spend today mostly doing an introduction context stuff of Isaiah and who he is, and then we'll get into uh, some of the Messianic prophecies, uh, trying to do about one a week or so um, as we go through uh, the rest of the, rest of the semester, um, although next week, uh, the 19th, uh, this, this is Pastor Dave, and I'll be filling in in State Center, so won't be able to uh, lead Bible class, so I'll either pre-record something or we'll do what, see if we can live stream or record what uh, Judy's doing uh, for the adult Bible class here at Memorial. Um, so we're looking at Isaiah, and again, broad context of how we can understand uh, the book of Isaiah. It's 66 chapters long. Uh, first half is condemnation, and second half is consolation. Uh, kind of a little more more detail in that sometimes than scholars can divide it into three parts. Uh, first ch 39 chapters uh, are full of warnings. Uh, chapters 40 to 55 are about hope in exile. Um, hope looking ahead to uh, hope for the people as they're in exile in Babylon. And then chapters 56 and 66 of the return from exile and looking even further ahead. Um, and so that's part of why it's good to look at Isaiah, um, I think, in, in this time of uh, uncertainty and things. And we'll touch on some of that later as we go on, too. Now, of course, the challenge, uh, one of the challenges is because these three part, these two or three parts are so different in, in tone, um, their scholars have thought that there might be maybe three Isaiahs, uh, up, to, up to three Isaiahs instead of just one. Um, you know, first one then would be if they divided into that and they divided in, into those sections kind of. Um, Proto-Isaiah, so first Isaiah, Deutero-Isaiah, second Isaiah, or tr and Trito-Isaiah, uh, third Isaiah. Um, but there's getting to be uh, less of that or at least less emphasis on that. Um, but for a while, the scholarly efforts were to kind of dissect all the all the biblical texts into figuring out where where they where they came from before they were assembled, uh, and now the uh, scholarly move is to dealing with what we have, uh, look at it as as it's as it's been passed down to us. Um, uh, of course, more conservative commentators, so like. Uh, what we do and what I'm using for a lot of my sources uh, for this are uh, no think there's just one Isaiah. Isaiah ben Amos of Jerusalem, who's active from 740 to 680 BC, uh, which you'll note is a really long time, and we'll talk about why that's important as we go too. That idea of of how important it is, you know, how long Isaiah was not only active, how long his book is, but how long he was active, um, and the you know, kind of big picture stuff that gives us uh, as we look at him. And of course, here we've got the stained glass window picture of Isaiah uh, from up front here in the sanctuary at Memorial. Um, so again, he's, he's above, above Mo, right above Moses in our big window up front. Um, so kind of he, Moses and Isaiah are among the kind of the most important um, uh, figures in the, in the Old Testament. Uh, as we reflect in that. All right, so how does the book of Isaiah begin? Well, it begins this way. Uh, the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, so Isaiah ben Amos, Isaiah son of Amos, uh, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. And so this means here Isaiah's active through, um, through four kings, at least four kings. Uh, we'll touch on uh, what we get there a little bit. Uh, kings of Judah. Uh, so again, he's active then during this time of uh, of the separated kingdom, of the divided kingdom, uh, that ap after King Solomon dies, uh, it's, it's divided into uh, Judah in the south and Israel in the north. 
Um, and, and that's kind of important. Part of what Isaiah sees uh, is then also during the, during the, during the time of his, of his he's active in ministry, uh, he sees Israel, uh, the northern kingdom, is, is conquered and taken away. Uh, and so, um, which gives a little, little bit of heft to some of what uh, his, his warnings are to the people of Judah and the kings of Judah of, you know, shape up or bad things are going to happen. Look what happened to the northern kingdom because they'd stra strayed far away from God. All right, so the, ki uh, the kings that are active here during um, Isaiah, during Isaiah's active ministry, um, King Uzziah, he's got a couple other names. Uh, Co-regency, uh, 751 to 740 B.C. Uh, Sol reigns uh, from 740 to 736, and then he's deposed and died. Oh, that's right. Uh, so King Uzziah is, uh, is first, and then Jotham is his co-regent. Um, that's what I meant here. And then, uh, and then, so after, as so Uzziah, Jotham gets skipped a little bit. Uh, and then we get Ahaz and Hezekiah and Manasseh. Uh, and Ahaz, um, and, and so and each of these kings is, is somewhat different in how they treat Isaiah, uh, in how, how well they listen to Isaiah, in, in what they do and how, how good their reign is. Uh, we'll, we'll look here at um, getting into here the King Uzziah, who's, who's, uh, who dies the year that Isaiah begins his ministry. Um, but then the other ones, um, the other, the other Kings again are, um, sort of are mixed, mixed in their things, uh, mixed in their views of how, how they're done, what, what they do, how, again, how well they listen to, uh, to God. Um, and yeah, all right, so. Uh, in Isaiah six, then is the in the year that King Uzziah died, and this is this is Isaiah's call story. We we went through this a little bit um, last time, uh, a while ago. Um, so in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And so again, King Uzziah is king of Judah from about 791 to 740 B.C. Uh, and it's sort of the Silver Age. So if the Golden Age is, uh, uh, Golden Age of Israel and Judah is when it was a united kingdom, so D King David and Solomon, uh, then the Silver Age would be under, in, be this the end of the, this is the end of the Silver Age here with Uzziah in Judah in the southern kingdom in Jeroboam, in Israel, the northern kingdom. So it was a, was a time of peace and prosperity. And so, um, and so, so it's good, but then the problem is we get all good things have, have come, uh, come to an end, will come to an end. Uh, there's a Uzziah tablet, uh, it's dated to about 30 to 70 e C E uh, AD, um, Around 700 years after it, um, so again, hither were brought the bones of Uzziah, king of Judah, not to be opened. Uh, not sure whether they're actually there, but again, the part of a um, proof, another extra biblical bit of evidence that he actually existed. Uh, and he was a good king, but he the, this was the problem. Um, so here we go. Uh, we get into some of what he, he does here. Uh, is recorded in Second Chronicles 26, and we get again we get because not only do we have I, Isaiah and what he's saying and doing in 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 his book, but we also because of uh, he's active over those four kings, we get bits and pieces of what Isaiah is doing uh, then in the books of Kings and Chronicles as well. Uh, so here's Second uh, Chronicles 26, and all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king instead of his father Amaziah. He built Aeloth and restored it to Judah after the king slept with his fathers. He was 16 years when he began to reign. He reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jechaliah of Jerusalem, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all his father Amaziah had done. He set himself to seek God in the days of Zechariah, who instructed him in the fear of God, and as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. So, starts off pretty well. Uh, then bad things happen for King Uzziah. But when he, Uzziah, was too strong, he grew proud to his destruction, for he was unfaithful to the Lord his God, and entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. 
But Azariah the priest went in after him with 80 priests of the Lord, who were men of valor, 18, and they, verse 18, and they withstood King Uzziah and said, It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for you have done wrong, and it will bring you no honor from the Lord God. Then Uzziah was angry. Now he had a censer in his hand to burn incense, and when he become, became angry with the priests, leprosy broke out on his forehead in the presence of the priests in the house of the Lord by the altar of incense. And Azariah the chief priest and all the priests looked at him, and behold, he was leprous in his forehead. And they rushed him out quickly, and he himself hurried to go out, because the Lord had struck him. And King Uzziah was a leper to the day of his death, and being a leper, lived in a separate house, for he was excluded from the house of the Lord. And Jotham, his son, was over the king's household, governing the people of the land. So again, Uzziah as king, um, not used to people telling him no. Uh, and so pride goes, gets to his head. He thinks he can do stuff that he can't. And then bad things happen to him, uh, him that way. Uh, so again, he's, he's stricken with leprosy. Uh, Rembrandt posts that a little uh, than that and so then so so the eight last years of his reign he's still able to do some things but he's cast out on uh, his his son's his son at Jotham has to do reign and so but the year he he dies is kind of a big big deal then so it's the beginning of the decline of Judah and the beginning and more bad stuff's coming for Israel um, that the time of peace and prosperity is come, going to come towards an end and so that in that beginning then that's when Isaiah is called, you know, so he's, he is called at the, at the, at the end of this golden age, end of the silver age, end of this time of peace and prosperity into a time where there's going to be all sorts of challenges and things. And so, uh, not, not an easy time for Isaiah to be a prophet. Um, but that's when God calls him, that's what he does. And so that's what he does. Um, of course, as he, he's called, uh, and he, he sees sees the Lord in the throne and his, the train of his robe fills the temple. Uh, he, he talks about how, how can I talk to you? I'm a man of unclean lips and these are people of unclean lips. And so the angel takes a coal from the, from the altar and puts it on his lips and says, great, you're holy now. You know, the word, the, I place the words in you and those are the words you're going to say. Those are the words that you're going to write down. Those are, that's what you're going to do. And so Isaiah is, um, given then, this the he's made holy he's called he's commissioned by God to be a prophet um, to speak the words that God gives him to say uh, which is going to be great but uh, he's going to face some challenges all right so that's the beginning that's the earliest part we get of Isaiah's ministry Isaiah 6 uh, the king Uz year King Uzziah dies which is about six about um, 740 BC um, but then in Isaiah 45, and this is part, this is one of the sections then, uh, and this is one of the reasons that people think there must have been another Isaiah who wrote later than this Isaiah. In Isaiah 45, we get, thus says the Lord to his anointed to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped, uh, to subdue nations before him, to loose the belts of kings, to open doors before him, that gates may not be closed. I will go before you and level the exalted places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and hordes in secret places that I may, you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I have called you by name. I name you, though you do not know me. That's also important. I am the Lord and there is no other. Beside me there is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me. That people may know from the rising of the sun to the w and the, from the west that there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is none other. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. So again, God's saying he's in control. But more than that, we get that name, Cyrus, who's the Persian emperor who reigns from 550 to 530 BC, 200 years after King Uzziah dies. And yet he's named here in Isaiah. Uh, so again, the content of Isaiah's prophecy spans two, at least 200 years between just those two points that we looked at. Isaiah 6, the year King Uzziah died, and yet here's Cyrus getting called. And Cyrus, of course, Persian emperor, uh, yet he's 
uh, described as the anointed of God. That uh, the fact that Isaiah is working and covering this much time uh, is just, again, part of what why it's so, so rich to look into what he's doing, uh, what's going on here. Um, and so, so Isaiah is active as a, as a prophet for 60 years. His vision spans at least two, 200 years uh, with that name of Cyrus. But then he's looking, of course, even further ahead uh, to the time of Jesus, uh, which is, of course, what we're going to be looking at the, uh, as, as we keep going on this, this semester, this, uh, this fall. Um, but also, of course, even further into the future, uh, towards the end when uh, we get not just the first coming of the Messiah, you know, that, but the second coming of the Messiah, uh, when Jesus comes, uh, comes again. Uh, we're, so we're still looking ahead and waiting for that to happen. All right, so here's some quotes then that kind of get us in and remind us of this importance of of Isaiah. So Isaiah is great for two reasons. He lived in momentous days and critical days of international upheaval, and he wrote what many considered to be the greatest book in the Old Testament. Uh, and so in the key, key theme uh, we're going to find throughout as we go through Isaiah is the salvation deliverance of the Lord. Uh, and so part of what this will look like then is also um, that we'll look at how, how God saves his people so this is salvation, deliverance of the Lord, how God saves his people uh, in the time of Isaiah, uh, how some of those then also foreshadow and look ahead to the way that God is going to save the world through Jesus in his first coming, and also looking ahead even further to how God is going to save the world when he comes again and finally get the, we get the new heaven and the new earth and, and there's no more sin or death or anything. Uh, like that at all. Uh, so there's key, key things, key themes of salvation and the deli deliverance of the Lord, looking ahead to the Messiah, to the anointed one of, of God, who's going to be the one to do this. Uh, and of course, as Christians, we interpret this and we see this all pointing to Jesus. Uh, all right. Um, so located on the, so here's the prophet Isaiah, located on the front of the historic Trinity Church. Uh, at the center, there's sculptures of six men, four right, gospel writers are flanked with Paul on the right and on Isaiah here on the left. Um, and this is from, um, uh, from Dr. Lessing, Reed Lessing's commentary on Isaiah that I got this quote from. Uh, so Isaiah's presence in this distinguished group, so the four gospel writers and Paul, speak volumes about his importance for understanding the Messiah. Note he's the only prophet, he's the only Old Testament guy who's, who, who's included there. Uh, Jerome, uh, early church father from 342 to 420 AD, uh, wrote of Isaiah, he should be called an evangelist rather than a prophet because he describes all the mysteries of Christ and the church so clearly that you think he's composing a history of what has already happened rather than prophesying about what is to come. So as we look at Isaiah, we're going to and look at these messianic prophecies in Isaiah. We're going to see how how Isaiah is looking ahead and how some of these prophecies are are very specific. Um, you know, if you think about prophecies being fulfilled, um, you know, a lot of times we get really vague ones. Um, uh, you know, that that the that we we find vague ones that are that are easy to understand. Well, how they got fulfilled? Well, that's because they um, it's. It's really vague. Anything, you can always interpret anything to do it, but they're pretty specific things. Um, and, but then that also creates problems. That's also part of why, again, people think there may have been more than, more than one Isaiah and, or that, and that the, these later Isaiahs were writing later because they couldn't, uh, couldn't have predicted this stuff. They had to have experienced it for themselves. Um, but again, that's part of what... Um, you know, we, if we trust the supernatural revelation of God being, you know, that Isaiah is inspired by God as he's uh, writing this book, as he's give, uh, given these visions and describing them, uh, then that problem goes away. Uh, so that's what Jerome, Jerome said. Uh, likewise, when Augustine uh, asked Ambrose for his advice on what to read, what he should read, uh, Augustine, of course, uh, author of the, the Confessions, he's a... Um, 
early church father. He get these important for us Lutherans because his uh, the group of the monastery. Uh, that Luther goes to, the, the order of monks that Luther's a part of, are named after him. They're Augustinians. Um, so follow his advice. Ask Ambrose. So Ambrose uh, was a, uh, Ambrose was the Bishop of Milan uh, and had been instrumental in Augustine's teaching uh, in, in a getting Augustine to, uh, to become a Christian. Um, and so, of course, mentor, mentor uh, for Augustine. So when Augustine asked Ambrose for his advice on what he should read, he suggested, Ambrose suggested Isaiah, because I believe he is more plainly a foreteller of the gospel and the calling of the Gentiles than are the others. And so, yeah, so the book of Isaiah composes a beautiful portrait of Israel's messianic hope and the savior of the world, Jesus. And so that's that's what we're, we're looking at. That's what, we're, what we'll be studying as we go through. Um, and then I, I, I found this and, and saw this shared a lot, uh, too. And I uh, figured I'd use this as, as a part, too. So we're looking here at, uh, this, is, this is from the, uh, the infographic Bible. Uh, so all the prophecies of Jesus, a big picture view of those promised in the Old Testament and fulfilled in the New. Uh, and so we see these different prophecies from... Uh, you know, from, from books in the Old Testament. Uh, and you'll note here, uh, the Isaiah section's pretty darn big. Um, so we'll, we'll see if we touch everything that, that this, this graph seems to think it's from. Um, but then they go to the, to the New Testament um, and how the Messianic prophecies are found from everywhere from the beginning of Matthew all the way to the end of the Reve Revelation. Of course, mainly, mainly focusing in here in the Gospels, but we find, find places in, the, in Paul's letters too, or in Acts, that we see uh, some of those prophecies uh, fulfilled. Um, that we see, you know, how, we see all these different things, um, different ways that Jesus is at work. Um, examples of how, uh, again, how, how, how these prophecies are fulfilled uh, and how miraculous it is that all of these things uh, were fulfilled in Christ. Um, and so uh, we'll close here then by looking at um, the hymn here, Isaiah Mighty Seer. Um, Isaiah Mighty Seer in days of old, the Lord of all in spirit did behold, high on a lofty throne in splendor bright, with robes that filled the temple courts with light. Above the throne were flaming seraphim, six wings had they, these messengers of him. With two they veiled their faces as was right, with two they humbly hid their feet from sight. And with the other two aloft they soared, one to the other called and praised the Lord. Holy is God the Lord of Sabbath. Holy is God the Lord of Sabbath. Holy is God the Lord of Sabbath. His glory fills the heavens and the earth. The beams and lintels trembled at the cry, and clouds of smoke enwrapped the throne on high. Well, thank you very much for, for joining us. Again, we'll see if I, this is the pre-recorded one. I'll try and live stream uh, Sunday, see how that goes, and we'll see how, the, how we go to continue. But thank you very much for uh, watching and listening.